Hi guys, it's AgriAdmin here and today in this tutorial I will tell you everything what you need to know about VROPS nodes. So I'll be talking about types of the nodes, I will tell you how do they work and what is continuous availability versus high availability. Let's start. Traditionally we have four different nodes in VROPS. It's master, master replica, data node, and collector. Which of them has a different task? And we'll be talking about those tasks later on. But from the version 8, we can have another node, fifth node. And that node is called witness node, and it is used in continuous availability mode. So let's have a look now what's inside the nodes. The first service is a watchdog. Watchdog is a Python script to monitor if VROP services are running or not. It runs every five minutes. If some service is not running, watchdog will try to restart service. How the watchdog knows that service is not running. It simply checks two things. It checks process ID, and it checks if the file exists, and it checks the status of the service. Now let's have a look on the second component, which is user interface. And we see we have two types of user interface, admin UI and product UI. Let's have a closer look on to admin UI. To access it, you need to add slash admin on the end of FQDN or IP of your VROPS. Here we can see admin UI. Upon login, we are landing on the system status page where we can see cluster status. It shows online. This is the place where we can take the cluster offline. As you can see, I have HA enabled. I'm not using CA, and I will talk about the CA and HA later on. Down below, we can see our nodes, their roles, status, and the metrics. Underneath, if we click on any node, we can see what adapters are reporting back. If we scroll to the right, we can see there's an option to switch on or off SSH. On the left hand side, we have a menu. As I said, we are landing on the system status. The next option is a software update. On the software update page, we can install a software and we can install pack files from the marketplace, from VMware or from the vendors. Next on the list is support. Here on the right hand side, we have listed logs, which we can have a look and troubleshoot the issue. In support bundles tab, we can generate and download support bundle. Finally, we have administrator settings where we can change administrator password. Also, we can provide settings for password recovery. Next component of our node is product UI. Product UI GUI should open by default. Should that not to be a case in your environment, you just need to put FQDN or IP slash UI to access product UI. As you can see from that screen, it has a lot of options. And as this video is about the VROPS nodes, I will skip going through all of them. If you would like a video about product UI, let me know in the comment section, leave a like and subscribe to my channel. To summarize this, admin UI is for administration purposes. Product UI is for day to day work with VROPS. And even if failure occur 
and something happen and you will lose access to product UI, admin UI should be still accessible. And the last component out of our three components is Suite API. Yes, there is an API available for VROPS. Now, if you ever wonder where is documentation for API, because you couldn't find any on the VMware website, wonder no more. The reason for it is very simple. It is enabled in VROPS. All you need to do is to type in your FQDN or IP of VROPS slash suit-api. Apache 2 HTTPD, that's the layer which provides backend platform for Tomcat instances which provides VROPS user interfaces. Next on our list is Collector. The collector is responsible for processing data from various solution adapter instances. The collector uses adapters to collect data from various sources and then contacts the gem file locator for connection information of one or more controller cache servers. The collector service then connects to one or more controller API gem file cache servers and sends the collected data. Next very important component is Gemfire. Gemfire is in memory data grid, meaning it uses RAM instead of the hard drives, which makes accessing data faster. The big advantage of using in memory data grid is scalability and resiliency. Also, software and hardware upgrades can be performed with non-destructive way. So Gemfire provides access to all operation data across all the nodes with very low latency. Now, we have also components called Controller and Analytics. The Controller manages the storage and retrieval of inventory of the objects within the system. Controller is responsible to map the collected data to the right resources and also retrieve data for the requested queries. The queries are performed by leveraging the Gemfire map reduce function that allows you to perform selective querying. This allows efficient data querying as data queries are only performed on selective nodes rather than all nodes. And now it is the time to present you analytics. Analytics is the heart of the VROPS and it's responsible uh, for tracking the individual state of every metric and then use various forms of correlation to determine whatever there are problems. At the high level, the analytics layer is responsible for the following task. Metric calculations, dynamic thresholds, alerts and alarms, metric storage and retrieval from the persistence layer, root cause analysis, historic inventory server for metadata calculations and relationship data. Finally, we have a persistence layer. Persistence layer gives VROPS the performance required for monitoring thousands of objects for which data is collected stored, analyzed, and retrieved. The performance layer works as a data service layer for all of the above layers, and the agility in this data service layer comes from using in-memory grid data Gemfire. This gives the scalability 
performance and availability. This layer also contains databases and we will go through all the databases and I'll be using the term sharding and I will explain in a few moments what that means. So sharding is the term that Gemfire uses to describe the process of distributing data across multiple systems to ensure that computational storage and network loads are evenly distributed across the cluster. Now, let's have a look what databases are in the persistence layer. First one is SFDB, which is file system database. It contains metric data and the super data for the discovery of resources. It also contains collected data from adapters. In this database, sharding occurs. Next database is Cassandra. Cassandra is known as a global DB. Cassandra contains all the data that cannot be shared. The majority of data is user configuration data that includes user created dashboard and reports, policy settings and alert rules, super metrics formulas, resource control objects, user access and roles, alert definitions, reports, licensing, and much more. That database is present on all nodes. However, it is active only on the master node and master replica node. Cassandra is also responsible for resizing your environment. So if you want to add a node or remove the node, that information is stored in the global DB. Next database is HSQL, which is HyperSQL DB, known as CASA, which is Cluster and Slice Administration. This database is present on all nodes, plus it is in memory data grip, which means it access data quicker. And it is responsible for all cluster administrative actions. For example, taking note of lines or upgrading the cluster. And on this DB, no sharding occurs. Next DB is central database known as replication DB. This is the part of VCOPS DB. And this DB is only present on master and master replica only if high availability is enabled. On the central DB, sharding occurs. As you can see on the diagram, there is a PG and the central because the data type is Postgres. Central DB stores resource inventory in metadata format. And finally, we have a historical inventory service database, which is sharded. His database holds historical information on all resource properties and parent-child relationships. His is used to change data back to the analytics layer based on the incoming metrics data that is then used for DT calculations. By DT, I meant dynamic threshold and symptom alerts generation. Now, let's have a look on the types of node and their roles. First node is a master node. Master node is the primary node and the initial required node in VROPS. All other nodes are managed by the primary node. In a single node installation, the primary node manages itself, has adapters installed on it, and 
performs all data collections and analysis. The next node is master replica. Master replica is exact copy of master node. This node is not doing any work, but just watching the master node all the times and syncing with the node to ensure that it can take its place once master fails. Master replica is required only in high availability mode. Next node is data node. Data node is needed in the large deployments where data node has all the adapters installed and perform collection and analysis. And this is to make sure that the primary node and replica node are focused only on cluster management. So master and replica don't do any collection analysis. The next node is collector. And to be more specific, it's remote collector. Distributed deployments might require a remote collector node that can navigate firewalls interface with a remote data source, reduce the bandwidth across data centers, or reduce the load on VROPS analytics cluster. Remote collectors only gather objects for the inventory without storing data or performing analysis. In addition, remote collector nodes might be installed on a different operating system than the rest of the cluster. And lastly, we have a witness node. That node is from version 8. To use VROPS continuous availability CA, the cluster requires that you have a witness node. If the network connection between the two fault domains is lost. The witness node acts as a decision maker regarding the availability of Virilize Operation Manager. If you would like to know more about CA, let me know in the comment section and I will make a special video telling you about continuous availability, which is cool feature if you have a large environment. Let's talk now what is high availability? High availability creates a replica of VROPS primary node and protects the analytics cluster against the loss of a node. One thing to remember is that enabling high availability is not a disaster recovery solution. When you enable HA, information is stored, duplicated in two different analytics nodes within the cluster. This doubles the system's compute and capacity requirements. Now, continuous availability separates the VROPS cluster in two fault domains and protects the analytic cluster against the loss of fault domain. A fault domain consists of one or more analytics nodes grouped according to their physical location in data center. When configured, two fault domains enable VROPS to tolerate failures of entire physical location and failures from resources dedicated to single fault domain. And this was only high level overview of HA and CA. If you want more in depth video, let me know in the comment section. Thank you for watching this tutorial. I hope you learned something new today. And if you do have any questions or comments, uh, please leave them down below. And if you want to talk to me about anything virtualization related, please use the Twitter and this is my handler. I want to invite you to visit my Facebook page. The address will be here. Also, if you can subscribe to newsletter on my blog, which is angrysysops.com, there is a tons of information about the virtualization. And one more thing, I am remember about competition. You can win free VMware exam voucher. Details are on my page, on my blog, angrysysops.com. And 
let me know in the comment section what next tutorial would you like to see. Okay, thank you very much and see you in the next one. Bye!